Welcome to the EJF board learning series. Uh, this week we're going to talk, or this month we're going to talk about conflict resolution in associations. So um, I'd like to introduce Todd Sinkins and Leslie Brown from Race Broom, who will be our main panelists on this discussion. Um, for those of you that attend these on a regular basis, I think this one's going to look a little different. Todd and Leslie are going to present some best practices for, you know, conflict avoidance maybe, and then also how we could start dealing with the conflicts. And then we were going to share some, you know, war stories, as we put it, um, and success stories and allow for questions and answers. So I'm going to go ahead and mute and turn this over to Todd and Leslie. Um, let me share the results of the poll. Everybody on this call says that their association is friendly and conflict is rare. So we're really, we're happy to hear that. So, all right, Todd and Leslie, I'll turn this over to you. Well, thank you, Mira. Um, I certainly appreciate the introduction. Um, the, you know, so we're going to talk a little bit about board dynamics, about inter-community dynamics, sort of techniques to deal with issues that might arise. Um, also, you know, a lot of this comes down to sort of common civility common um, problem solving techniques. Um, you know, let's talk about, first of all, the ideal versus reality. Ideally speaking, a board is all pointing in the same direction. It's supportive of all the decisions made by the board members, even if there is a difference of opinion um, that once a vote go, is made, that all the members of the board take the actions necessary to fulfill that vote, even if they voted against it. Reality can be very different. You know, reality can be, you know, you have board members actively attempting to undermine decisions of the board. With respect to the community, you can have community members actively engaged in trying to undermine the interests of the association. And these situations can create challenges both for managers and for board members in terms of how to deal with these situations where conflict is coming up and interfering with the goals of the association and the, and the board and management's conduct of the association's business. Here's some problems caused by the divided board, minority boards, uh, minority directors acting to undermine the vote of the majority. Um, also, you know, that's what I just, you know, discussed. I actually have a situation, I've had a situation where I have a board member on one of my clients that has filed complaints about the association while serving on the board, that has worked with their local government, trying to undermine efforts by the board to get some accommodations from the local government, et cetera. You know, legitimate question as to whether or not these are a breach of duty, uh, but certainly they create challenges for boards moving forward. Um, majority marginalizing minority. Certainly I see this in my practice with some frequency, particularly when you have very strong-willed uh, people on the board who get control, often present, sometimes just the strongest uh, personality. And what they'll do is try to railroad through their agenda without regard for the concerns and interests and opinions of those that differ in opinion. Um, this comes up a lot. Um, it's very much uh, personality driven, um, but you can find this dynamic anywhere from a small uh, condominium to a large community. And then membership losing faith in board. You know that that will occur when the members find that the board has made dis mistakes, sometimes simply because members have differences of opinion as to what the agenda and priorities should be. A lot of times this comes up when the boards may raise assessments because of um, inflationary pressures or other increase, uh, increases in costs. Um, and members um, are focused solely on how much they wanna pay each month. So talk a little bit about results of a split and vote, so to speak. This is where the board of directors votes um, and they make a decision, but it's not unanimous. 
Um, board members are fiduciaries. They certainly can disagree on policy. Uh, however, it really is a breach of duty to work actively to undermine the position of the rest of the board, unless there's some illegality in board, involved in the decision making of the of the board that that was in the majority. Um, you know, as I said earlier, it's important that they still work together for a common goal, even when they may disagree. You know, and in my practice, I see this run, you know, completely, you know, it's full spectrum from board members actively working to undermine the decision of the rest of the board members, whereas in others, they accept that they're in the minority and then will, you know, embrace the decision of their colleagues and work towards it. Um, and it's our opinion, and we believe that for a, full, a better functioning association and board, that board members respect decisions in the majority, you know, even if they don't agree with it. So, you know, the first part of this presentation is focused a lot on sort of how to, you know, sort of the general law on, on directors. And it's also going to focus a lot on um, how to deal with the board members and board members' duty as fiduciaries. You know, the jurisdictions, you know, the local jurisdictions all recognize fiduciary duty uh, of condominium and homeowners association board members. Um, it's imposed on board members either by statute or common law. Um, it's actually in included within the DC Condominium Act. So for DC condominiums, it's actually statutorily um, included within the scope of the statute. Um, it's also imposed on board members by common law, um, both in you know in, in all the, all three local jurisdictions. So as a fiduciary, a director has an obligation to perform their duties in good faith. Um, it means they have what's called an undivided duty of loyalty to the association, which in turn means that uh, directors have an obligation to prioritize the interests of the association above anyone else's, and that may include their own. They are not entitled to take advantage of their position on the board for their own personal interest. Um, if a board member has what's called a conflict of interest, that's when their own personal interests may conflict with the interests of the board, um, they have obligations under the law to address that. I think I'll touch on those in a little, in a little bit. Um, you know, behavior that violates that duty um, creates liability exposure for the association and can also create individual liability exposure for the board member who's in breach of their duty. So sort of this slide reiterates some of those points. You're, you know, the obligations perform the responsibilities in good faith. Um, the standard of review of board, dis, board members' decisions is what's called, uh, applies the business judgment standard. And that's applied by statute and for DC condominiums and by common law in other jurisdictions or for other entities in DC. Um, that has, two components to it. I'm going to touch on those because it relates to this, the, the bullet point about get the facts. So one component is that the board had the authority to take the act that is subject to challenge. And then the second is whether they, um, whether they perform that action, you know, exercising their level of care that a board member in a similar situation would that a normal, a normal board member would. So that essentially, you know, that duty of care, that second element is what's important um, in the sense that in most instances, board members are gonna have authority, although they might not, you might need to look at your legal documents to see if the board can take those actions. Um, but, um, you know, the real key is, is, you know, engaging in that level of inquiry that's responsible that's re required for a responsible board member. And that requires knowing and understanding the facts associated with the issue presented to the board. So what I always advise my clients when I go through a board training session, um, and, and I always address this topic during my board training sessions, so that 
you know, most important thing that if you take away anything from this training, the most important thing that you should take away is that you know, use your common sense. If you don't think you understand the issue, then don't vote on it. You know, ask management to get you the additional information that you feel that you need in order to be able to fully uh, understand and vote on an issue um, that's before you. You know, if you need expert consultation, you should seek it if that's necessary to make a fully informed decision. Also, keep in mind that it is a defense to a breach of fiduciary duty claim is the reliance upon advice from experts. You know, you can you can that's a that's a defense to any claim that a director breached her duty if they took action as advised by an expert that they've consulted with. So I would do that. Also, make certain you know you you take the other necessary actions to under to fully understand the issue before you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this in a second. Uh, the other thing is that as directors, you're going to be in possession of confidential information from time to time. The, you know, so individual, in my opinion, individual board members don't have a right to reveal confidential information of the board without the rest of the board, you know, voting to approve that. Sometimes that confidential information is, a, is privileged. Communications to and from legal counsel are subject to the attorney-client privilege. And a decision to release that information to another person uh, will serve to waive that privilege if that person's not also covered within the scope of privilege. Typically, that privilege will extend to um, other directors, officers, and usually management. Um, it can extend to others depending upon um, the scope of the issue. Like, for instance, if there's a matter of um, that um, might involve architectural control, for instance. You might have members of the architectural control committee um, so that would be included within the privilege. Hey, Mira, my, my screen just completely changed, and I think I've been moved from the presenter to the... Um, I think Leslie, Leslie logged off for something. I don't know. Um, I can't... Oh. That, we so, just had a we had a, just had a flicker of our power in our building. Uh, okay, I um, didn't get logged off, but she might have. So I'm going to pause for a second while well, she's actually, to get back on. And let's and let's talk for a second, Todd. Honestly, sure. um, that extension of privilege. I know that I had a situation with an association where they it became very unclear who was covered by privilege, and so I want to make this statement to the clients on the call that you know. It, all of your emails that come from your lawyers do say that you're protected by privilege, but you do need to be very careful with how you're sharing those. Um, because once, if you if you give up the privilege, essentially, Todd, like if, if I forward something to someone who's not covered by that privilege relationship, um, then I have given up the privilege and that makes it discoverable. Do I understand that correctly? Yeah, I mean, so I mean, first of all, I don't think any board should make a decision to give information provided by the attorney to a person outside the board or, or the manager without having a discussion with the attorney first to see whether or not the attorney believes are covered within the scope. Essentially, these, yeah, the, the jurisdictions have a concept called um, um, sorry, Leslie just popped her head in. She's <laughs> trying to get power back for her computer. Okay. Um, so we'll just deal with that for the moment. Um, the, and bear with me, I'm actually gonna pull it up so that if we need to. Oh, you can run the, you can run the PowerPoint. Yeah, hold okay. on, sorry. But as I was starting to say, um, I think you need to have that conversation. Um, with counsel before any decisions made. You don't want to inadvertently, um, you don't want to inadvertently um, waive privilege. Right. You know, and what I typically tell clients is that assume that if you talk to anybody other than management or the board on a matter, that you're waiving the privilege. Right. You know, includes your next door neighbor, includes your best friend, includes your spouse, your family right. members. You can't really discuss privileged information beyond the board 
management and council. You know, unless you have an open and honest conversation with council and your colleagues on the board um, on the privilege and whether or not it's, it, you know, whether or not the association's position will be harmed by sharing it. Um, so that's, you know, typically the sort of my advice to clients and how I approach that topic. Um, the, you know, so that's, that's sort of been my, my typical recommendation to my clients on the issue of privilege and possible waiver of it. Um, I also believe that it's a decision of the board. I don't think in any, any individual owner has, you know, should, or any other individual board member should take it upon themselves to make the unilateral decision that for sharing information provided to or from council to others. You know, that's a, that's a policy decision of the board. I think it's a board as a body that needs to make that decision. Um, and um, I think that there are circumstances where we're doing that unilaterally will cause that director not only to compromise the interests of the association, also will have essentially brief and privileged. Um, so I think that that's also something important to understand. Um, so while we're waiting for Leslie, let's let's spin a a scenario here. Sure, sure. Let's let's just say that you know you and I and Scott are our three member board of directors, and mm -hmm. I decide that my boyfriend needs to know a privileged thing, and I I tell them that. What would you recommend that you and Scott, as remaining board members, do as a next step there? I say I, I would, so I would say okay. So, so the three of us, mm -hmm. you know, well, we'll first of all. You can't do that until we sort of make a decision on this. Okay. And I think before we make a decision, I think we need to consult with, with our attorney. Okay. Because we need to understand how this will affect us. Let's assume for the purposes of this scenario that we're that the association's in litigation mm -hmm. and it's been sued over a water leak issue in a condominium building. And that let's let's extend it so that that communication is a copy of the experts report that we've retained to serve as our expert consultant, Got which it. who has provided an opinion that uh, on the cause of the water leak. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if we were, if that opinion is negative, then we certainly would be problematic to disclose that. Um, you know, if it's positive, that might be something that you have a different, you, there might be strategic reasons why you might want to reveal that to someone else. So I think the first, what you do as a board is say, okay, well, let's talk to the lawyer before we do that. And then you have that conversation with the lawyer and they'll advise you, well, understand that if we provide this, then any communications between you and me on this particular topic will, um, you know, those are also discoverable. So let's say, so the consequence might be in the litigation that, um, there might be a subpoena issued or, or a, there might be a discovery scheduled for depositions. Mm -hmm. You know, and they might just choose to depose your lawyer based upon the information that you have, you know, disclosed to your boyfriend. Okay. Because you have then released, waived the privilege. And by doing it, it not only makes that report that we were talking about discoverable, but also allows any communications about the report to become discoverable. And so it can be, have fairly catastrophic impacts upon um, an association's um, litigation that might be ongoing at a, at a particular time. So, you know, in, in my, um, my advice to all my clients on these topics is that um, don't reveal opinions communications, correspondence from a, your attorney, unless there's been a conversation about doing so and the consequences of doing so. Okay. And so, so if this happens, are you looking to, if, if I've done this and I've damaged the case, would you be recommending as in, take off your board member hat now and your counsel to the board, would you be recommending that the bylaws be looked at and you discuss possible removal of me as a director? Because I I violated my fiduciary duty. 
Maybe. I mean, it, it, I mean, there are certain layers to it first. Um, yeah. So I've had a, I had a case recently. Actually, it's really pretty pertinent to this discussion. Mm -hmm. And we have a case in litigation for DC condominium right now. Um, it there's a owner who is a landlord. Um, they have an extremely problematic tenant and so we're in litigation. One of the board members was actively communicating with that board member. That board member, we have sued that board member and that board member separately has filed a complaint with the Human Rights Commission or Human Rights Office in DC alleging housing discrimination uh, as against the association. Okay. So this particular board member um, decided they were engaged in emails and text exchanges with this particular, with the person who were adverse to. Okay. Some of which were concerning, I wouldn't say that they were admissions, but frankly, because I don't think there's anything to admit, but they were unduly sympathetic to the position of this person that we're adverse to. Okay. And so the president reached out to me, so what do we do about this? And so what I advised at that moment in time was that I think the best thing to do for this particular issue is that, you know, you've got two options. You know, one, you can ask the person to resign. Frankly, because touching on what you asked, yes, there is a process for removal of directors, but I don't have a client where that process doesn't require a vote of the entire membership. And so that's a couple of months process sure, at a minimum, yeah. right? And this is a, an active issue. So I said, the other is that you can do this. I've had a number of clients, particularly where we have these problematic board members who are trying to undermine the interests of the, of the association, where you can create what, what's called an executive committee of the board. And that committee of the board will consist of those board members who are not conflicted or otherwise causing, issues, causing the prob problematic behavior. So in that instance, I prepared a charter to create an executive committee of the board that consisted of the other four board members, five person board, that would then be delegated responsibility for dealing with the entire adverse litigation. And that all communications would be between myself and that exactly. group of four, excluding that person who was um, communicating directly with the um, adverse owner. Okay. And so that's that's the way I, I've dealt with that. And I've had to deal with that or, or use that technique probably about a half dozen times over the last 10 years. Um, and it's um, it's always worked. Okay. Um, you sometimes get board members who complain that they're being denied the ability to perform their fiduciary duty. Um, but I've never had it go more than, you know, their verbal complaints. Okay. Hi, Leslie. Welcome back. Hi. <laughs> I don't know what okay. happened. <clears throat> Um, Leslie, could you bring back up this thing? Yeah, I'm trying to... because I don't have the most recent saved version. I don't know where it's saved. So okay, <laughs> we've been doing yeah. some hypotheticals while while Mira uh, was, you know, filling the space, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Very well. Give me a second. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean it's it's amazing some in some cases just how um committed to a an adverse position that members of a board can be even if it's clear the rest of the board disagrees with them right are you going to start the slideshow yeah uh -huh. where did we stop um, um i'll tell you when to stop <laughs> I think it was slide six. Okay. Here. I don't see your slideshow. We're, you're not sharing, we're seeing the comment screen, Leslie. You're not um, sh sharing your screen. I think you're sharing the app. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I've had this. I've had this issue recently. Okay, let me stop. Let me stop this. Stop share. Start share. Are you seeing it now? Yes. Okay. And then start slideshow and we'll tell you when it's. Can I come from the beginning? 
Either one. Or current, or current slide, doesn't matter. From current slide. Are you not seeing that? I am seeing it, but click on current slide. I actually think you'd finish this one, Todd. I think we need to go to the next oh, one. Yeah, let's go to the next one. Business judgment rule. Okay. Yeah. So are, are you seeing it? No. Nope. We are we're seeing we're seeing the SharePoint screen, not the SharePoint slideshow screen. <sighs> I'm really sorry. Um, I'm uh, gonna fix this. Business judgment rule, Todd. Do you want to talk on that while Leslie? Yeah, yeah, I'll talk about slide. business judgment rule. It, it's it's and I, I've already touched on a lot of it. Um, it's a care. It, it, it's the care and skill of an ordinarily prudent director would exercise in a similar situation. Um, is sort of the, the the standard I was touching on before. You know, it's a two part test. First, do you have the authority to act, and two, do you engage in that um, care and and in, in care and in skill. So, um, you know, how do you fulfill that? You know, I, I've talked about seeking the assistance of management counsel and consultants. Others, are, other aspects that are really basic, attend your meetings, read the board package, be familiar with the governing documents, read any reports that might be relevant to the issue that you're voting on. It's really mostly common sense. Make sure you understand what you're doing and what you're voting upon. Um, you know, if you do that and you're not acting in a way that's violative of the acts um, or the documents, um, then you're going to be, you're going to be found to have fulfilled your fiduciary duty. Next slide, please. I'm going to talk a little bit about vicarious liability because I think it's something that a lot of board members and a lot of folks don't understand. Um, so vicarious liability is a concept where a representative of an entity can bind and create liability for the entity that they represent. So for a for a condominium or a homeowners association, that would apply to board members. It might apply to any volunteers and also would apply to management. Can you um, give an example of that, Todd? Yeah, I'm going to give you an example from a case. Okay. Okay. So. This applies in, this is a, there's a Virginia case that's on point. It's a Virginia Supreme Court decision. And it's from the 1990s and involved a condominium called the Watergate at Landmark Condominium. It's a very large condominium in the city of Alexandria. So back in the late 90s, I think it was 96, 97, um, Watergate Landmark had decided that they were going to engage in a search process to potentially hire a new tennis pro. This is a large condominium with crazy amenities. And they had an on-site tennis pro. Um, they decided to give the incumbent the right to interview for their position. The incumbent was a 60, I think it was 62 year old woman, if I recall correctly. The Board appointed an ad hoc committee to conduct the screening interviews. There was no committee charter. There was no official act. They just appointed a couple of people. You're an ad hoc committee. Conduct the interviews. So they did so, and they interviewed the incumbent. And at the end of the interview, one of the members of the, one of the interviewers said, thank you very much, but we really want somebody younger for this position. Oops. So that person then did not, get hired to keep their job or rehired, sued the association for age discrimination and employment. The association defended on the basis that the person was not an official representative of the association that made the statements. They were simply an ad hoc committee member. That committee was only created for a very limited purpose. They were not authorized to make these decisions and therefore couldn't have acted on behalf of the association. The association is not responsible for the statements made by that interviewer. Virginia Supreme Court got the case, heard, you know, considered that defense and rejected it. So that with respect to that employee, that person interviewing for that job, they were believed that they were interviewing with somebody representing the association. It doesn't matter what your intentions are, or how much that you believe that that person um, you know, was authorized to act in that way, whether or not they went beyond what you authorized. The important thing is that the person that they were that was in the interview with them had the perception that that person is, is acting on behalf of the association. And therefore, Watergate Landmark, you're bound by their statements, even if she went beyond the authority that you granted to her. 
So the bottom line for this, and it's important because I hear a lot of times board members will say, well, I'm acting now as an owner, not as a director. And the reality is you can say that, but the law is not going to recognize that distinction in most instances. Because it doesn't matter what you intend. It matters what the other people around you might believe. And you can say, you can try to flip-flop your hats, you know, based upon the convenience of the circumstances. But the reality is that people around you, if they know you're on the board, they're going to assume that you're acting and you're making statements as a board member, even if you are trying to create that distinction. Um, and so you need to be careful what you say when you're on a board. You, know, you have to assume that what you're, when you're acting or speaking on something related to the association business, that you're acting on behalf of the association, not yourself. Okay. Um, so I'm going to talk just for a couple minutes on indemnification and insurance. Um, and I'm, I'm touching on these because I think they're relevant to the issues of, of you know, this conflict resolution, because this is what happens when things go awry. So first of all, board members typically, typically are going to be indemnified under bylaws and also by statute. And they're going to create an obligation from the association to indemnify, defend, and hold harmless the board member against claims arising out of their activities as a board member. And it typically, often will also apply to officers and committee members. There are going to be exceptions. So and for most actions, board members are not going to have any personal liability exposure. There might be some exceptions, intentional misconduct or knowing violations of the law, criminal acts, and you know, receive an improper personal benefit, essentially bribery. If you do those things, then you might be personally liable. But otherwise, you should expect protection from the association. The, the defense and in, in liability hopefully is going to be covered under the association's directors and officers liability insurance policy. That, that's the insurance that's designed to protect the association, its officers, and directors against claims um, arising out of their performance as directors and activities as directors. Um, there might be exclusions in those policies. We're going to touch on those in a minute. If those exclusions are, are triggered, then the association is going to have the obligation to provide the indemnity and defense out of its own assessment income. There are some things though that the DNO policy is not going to cover. Um, it's I would not expect there to be any coverage for claims alleging defamation, you know, which is libel or slander um, against a board member um, for at, for statements that they may make um, while serving in the board. Um, there's never insurance coverage for criminal acts. If you break the law, you're on your own. Um, Claims for non-monetary damages. Um, I'm surprised I'm still seeing insurance policies that include this exclusion. Um, this is when an association is sued instead of the, the plaintiff seeking um, damages, they instead are seeking a court order either to prevent the association from doing something or to uh, require the association to take an act that it doesn't wish to take. Um, this was a fairly common exclusion 15 years ago. Um, it's been written out of a lot of the ISO forms and also proprietary um, policies, but I frankly read a policy about three months ago that still included an exclusion for this. Um, word of advice, don't ever get directors and officers insurance through State Farm or Nationwide. Um, their insurance, DNO policies are terrible. Um, the, um, and I think they both still have this exclusion. I know State Farm does. Um, and I had a case with Nationwide years ago where my client, they had a different insurance carrier, would have had to pay $1,000 uh, in defense costs, but because they had this provision, um, they had to pay $60,000 in defense costs out of pocket. Um, the last thing I'm going to touch on is particulates and pathogens. Um, there are actually two separate exclusions you'll find in policies. Particulates um, will relate to claims arising out of dust, dirt, um, that type of thing. I actually had this claim about 10 years ago for a client of mine in DC, um, where the association was sued for failure to properly maintain the common elements um, due to dust um, accumulation in a penthouse unit. So the condominium were all million dollar units plus. Um, and so um, this particular exclusion was in their policy and the insurance carrier did not provide defense coverage. This association had to defend itself out of pocket. The other is pathogens, which nobody really cared about until three years ago. 
or two and a half years ago. Now everybody cares about it. Um, uh, in 2020, there was very little coverage for claims arising out of viruses or pathogens. There might have been some policy. There were some policies that um, I think a liability claim would have been paid out of if there's a claim arising out of a virus. But by the end of 2020, all the um, ISO forms were rewritten, and I think all the proprietary policies, such as CNA, travelers, et cetera, had all modified the policies to make explicit that there was not going to be coverage for claims arising out of viruses. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Leslie for now. Thanks, and I apologize, and hopefully I won't lose power again. Uh, I'm going to talk about managing board member conduct, and I think um, we are advising our clients more and more for boards to adopt a formal board code of conduct that outlines basically how the board is going to operate uh, in terms of its conduct, its decorum. Um, usually these types of policies just reiterate that it's expected that board members will attend meetings and arrive on time and they'll actually re review board materials in advance. I mean, we know that a lot of board members sometimes are looking at the board packet while the meeting is happening. And we really encourage board members to actually review the materials in advance because it will actually cut down on your meeting time because any questions that you have, you can go back to management um, and say, hey, what, you know, what's going on with this contract, you know, what, what is this provision? And if you can get your questions answered in advance, then it's going to cut down on a lot of discussion time um, during your actual board meeting. Silence your devices. I know that's very difficult in this day and age because we're all rely on our phones so much, but it really is important to be able to stay focused during the board meeting. Um, avoid interruptions while others speak. Uh, the board president is generally the chair of the meeting. And while most boards kind of fall under the Robert Smoules small entity rules, so you don't have to do all of the formalities of having the chair recognize the speaker and um, wait until the board members recognized by the chair before actually speaking, you know, it's a good idea if you find that your um, meetings or are that the board is interrupting each other a lot is to actually have the board president formally recognize someone to speak before they actually speak. Um, that's in Robert's rules. And then this next one, it seems obvious, right? Not no use of derogatory insulting language, but sometimes in the heat of the moment, it, board members can lose their cool. And um, that's not okay. No one should uh, be get to that point where they're so triggered that they have to um, use poor profanities or insulting language. Um, and then just a reminder in the code that directors owe a duty of respect to the board, the association, their colleagues, and the membership. So it is a duty of respect. And it kind of goes back to um, what Todd was saying about the duty of care and the duty of loyalty. When you're on the board, you um, have to put the the board, the association's interests before your own as an individual unit owner. And as he said, there's really no distinction in the law. You can't put on your your board member hat, take it off, and then put on your owner hat. It's it's very hard um, to have a clear delineation like that. So you always have to remember that. When people in the community look at you, they're looking at you as a board member. Leslie, can I ask a quick question of you? Sure. Um, I see that you've got that directed towards board members. I know that I had a couple of associations recently. Make that for everyone. Is that something that you talk about? You know, that it's expected that everyone will treat each other with respect. And, you know, you can't come at board members sideways and is that something that you all would recommend? Yeah, and we've I've actually started making separate policies in addition to a board in, in addition to the board member conduct is but a, just a global anti harassment policy yeah. that applies to board members, owners, employees, management against against everybody that you yeah. know that we're just going to create in our community a culture of 
inclusivity and treating each other with respect. So, right. and I think that that's something that can lead to fewer conflicts if you have that to point back to. Absolutely. So, so as I kind of mentioned, conduct means the 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 president is the chair of the meeting or the vice president if the uh, president's not available. And use of Robert's rules. Again, most boards kind of fall under the small board category, so you don't have to go through every formality of Robert's, but you should. It's good practices, and our firm has plenty of resources about basics on motions, second, seconding, tabling, who has the floor, uh, those types of things. So again, speak only when recognized by the chair. Use formal motions, and the minutes should reflect who made the motion, who seconded, and how the vote went down. Adhere to the agenda, um, which should include even a, a, a line item action of adopting the agenda, because then when the board adopts the agenda, they're all committing to talking about the topics that are actually on the agenda and not straying and talking about other topics. And that's where um, boards can lose focus, where you start to run out of time, um, you get uh, distracted. So taking the step of actually adopting the agenda is a good idea. Reading and approval of the minutes. Again, the board should be looking at the board packet before the meeting. And if there are uh, issues with the minutes, you know, corrections, spelling errors, do that in advance. I actually just attended a board meeting where they were at the portion of the beginning of the meeting where they were going to approve the last meeting's board minutes. And one of the directors said he had 106 changes to the minutes, uh, grammatical, typos, spelling, et cetera. And in my head, I'm thinking he could have done this before. You're not going to spend your meeting correcting meeting minutes. So, you know, do that type of stuff in advance so it doesn't take away from the substantive um, issues. You know, open forum, again, uh, you know, having that period where owners can, uh, air their grievance, you know, they don't get to occupy their meeting, but they do get that designated period. And we do recommend time limits, um, you know, maybe having a sign in sheet, you know, that's how we used to do it before COVID when we actually met in person, but you can still do something similar to that over Zoom. Going through the officer committee and management reports, um, you know, you could also do in this case like a consent agenda. If the if you if the board gets the reports and they don't have any questions, you know, you could just you know move through that via a consent agenda process. And then you have your action items, you have the unfinished business, and then you have the new business. And if you stick to this. You know, you should be able to get the business of the association done. And we always kind of throw out the two hour rule um, because studies have shown that it, once meetings start to go back past two hours, people um, lose focus, they're, they're not paying attention, they get antsy. So in that case, if you feel like you have a topic that's going to monopolize the majority of your time, maybe hold a special meeting of the board just to deal with that one topic so you can get through that, um, the rest of the items separately and then just have focus on that one important topic. And then rules governing meeting agenda. This is from Robert's rules. Uh, is once the agenda is adopted, it actually can only be changed by a vote of two thirds of the directors. This is a little Robert's rules trick. Um, and then any matter that has been voted on previously by the board or committee may only be reconsidered if a director makes a formal motion to rescind the prior vote and the motion passes by two thirds of votes. So this can happen. Maybe the board, you know, voted some way, but then, you know, after a while, wait, wait a second, guys. Maybe this didn't go the right way. Maybe we should reconsider. Well, there is a formality in Robert's rules for for how to do that. Um, dualities and conflicts of interest. So again, we keep talking about how the board, everybody is a fiduciary, which means they own a duty of loyalty and a duty of care. And part of the duty of loyalty means avoiding conflicts of interest, nepotism, or personal benefits. You know, you may have a landscaping company that would like to bid on the work, you know, the landscaping services for the association. Well, then that's a direct financial conflict of interest, which you should disclose and then, you know, recuse yourself um, from that type of vote, or maybe it's your spouse. Um, it could also deal with covenants violations. If a director is 
not following the rules, then you know their participation in any deliberation on that matter is a direct conflict of interest, and it's not appropriate for them to participate on that topic. Um, you know, if the director believes that there that the conflict doesn't rise to a level where it impedes their ability to exercise their fiduciary duty, then the director is obligated under law to state their reasons on the record and their intent to participate in the discussion and vote on the motion. So they actually have an affirmative duty to say why they don't think there's a conflict and why it's okay for them to participate. And then again, if there is the conflict, then the director has to recuse themselves from that vote. If they don't recuse themselves, then you know they expose themselves to claims of potential breach of duty and some personal liability there because they're taking an affirmative action not to do the right thing. So some examples of a conflict of interest is when the board intends to review a case involving compliance, like I talked about before, or the contract example that I mentioned before. And really, as a golden rule, no board should vote to approve, you know, spending money for services from any member or relative of a board member or an entity that's affiliated like with that board member, unless it's disclosed and it's on the record that there's a good reason why this contract, you know, is in the best interest of the association, despite the contract. Um, so enforcement like so let's say you're a board and you're like wow Leslie this all sounds really great we're gonna adopt a code of conduct just like you said and we're we're gonna have our lawyers draft it well what happens if someone breaches what happens in the practical real world well we you know the way we draft these policies is that you know everything there's sometimes the conflict happens in the heat of the moment of the meeting right when a board member maybe goes off on another board member and uses foul language um, or gets aggressive you know i think in that case it's appropriate for the chair to immediately right then and there issue you know a reprimand to that board member and you know maybe pause the meeting so that uh everyone can cool down a little bit um, but in other types of situations, it may, you may have more time to actually issue a formal notice to the board member, putting it on the record in writing that whatever they're doing is not okay and asking them to stop the behavior or cease the activity. Um, and if those informal uh, methods don't work, you know, the way we craft these policies is that the there could be a private letter of censure issued to the board member, or there could be a public censure. Um, you know, if your community has some sort of like website or newsletter or something, if it gets that point, you know, the board could publicly say, hey, you know, this, this board member is violated the code of conduct. Um, this is what happened and here's why. And we just want it on the record for the community to know. Um, if it's really bad, you can request that that board member resign. Now, there's we get questions a lot. Well, can the board vote a board member off? And the answer is generally no, because the members vote board members on, and the members usually have the right to take board members off. Having said that, though, if the board member is an officer, like secretary, treasurer, um, the board does have the power to remove somebody from their officer position, even though they don't have the ability to remove them from their board position. So if somebody's the treasurer, you may you say, you know what, we don't think this is an appropriate role for you anymore. And I've seen that happen before, um, where the board, you know, removes somebody from their uh, officer um, position, even though the board can't remove them uh, from the board completely. Um, in some cases, it may be appropriate to suspend a board member's privileges and rights of a, as a member of the board, such as receiving confidential information. We, I had one case that did end up leading to the board member being removed by the membership where the board member's girlfriend um, in the community was delinquent. And this board member was sharing <laughs> with the um, the girlfriend, what, what the board was planning to do as far as collecting on her delinquent account, which is completely 
inappropriate. So we went through the steps. We we wrote a letter. We um, removed that board member from their officer position as the board did. Um, and then we told them that they weren't going to be entitled to participate in any deliberations um, or receive any information about collections of this account. And it got to the point where the board recommended to the community that the community move this director and the, and the vote passed. Um, it was a contentious meeting, but um, this, this board member was breaching all of the duties. So um, that's an example of that. You know, the resolution could also provide for fining uh, subject to notice and an opportunity for a hearing um, for a rules violation, like other policy violations in, in the jurisdictions that we practice in. So that's possible. And then, as I stated in my example, you know, initiate the removal process in accordance with the bylaws, which it basically means the board is making a recommendation to the rest of the community and calling a special meeting for that purpose. Um, I've been witness to a couple of these. I had that one where the board member was removed. I had one where the board member was not removed. They, he didn't get the vote. And then I have one pending right now that's gonna happen actually on Monday. So we'll see We'll see how that goes. I think um, it's really, if the board really feels like it's gotten to this point, it's very important for the rest of the board members to all be on the same page about the action and to clearly articulate why it's no longer appropriate for this person to serve on the board. So just some best practices before we take more questions. Again, adopt the code of conduct. You know, you definitely want your legal counsel to, to write that. You know, conduct annual board training. Our office does it for offers it for our clients. And the training doesn't just go through what we have been talking about, but just basics, you know, the basic law that applies to community associations, some of the hot topics that um, boards may deal with, like smoking and noise and fair housing. And really, we feel like the more educated the board is, there's less room for conflict because everyone has the same shared understanding of what the, the basic law is that applies. Um, minimize email debate. You know, we I, I say that, you know, it's easy to be tough behind a keyboard. You know, it's easy for the insults to slur over a keyboard than when you're seeing someone actually in person, face-to-face. -face. That, that personal connection is really important. So we really um, encourage, you know, have tell boards not to rely on email to, to conduct debates. And quite frankly, they really shouldn't be because it could violate some of the open meeting requirements that um, our jurisdictions impose for board meetings. Um, and that those deliberations on topics should be taking place in open forum, unless they're an executive session type of um, matter. CAI is the Community Associations Institute. I know our firm is very active in it. I know EJF is very active in it. It's basically the premier trade organization for the community association industry, and they have what's called a civility pledge. And the board could decide as a group, yes, we're going to adopt this civility Pledge. It's available on the CAA website. It's only like one or two pages. It may be something we're taking a look at. Attend industry educational sessions. Again, CAI has plenty of free educational sessions for board members. They actually do a board member board leadership development training that's free. Um, I know our firm has, uh, if you go to our website, you can join our mailing list and then you'll get invites to all of our invitationals, which are also free. I know EJF is doing this. They do all sorts of things for their clients. So there's plenty of ways to get educated. And that just all goes back to being more informed about how the community is supposed to operate, which can reduce conflict. And then in really egregious cases, um, you could bring in a third party mediator. I, I did that recently with a client. It wasn't board conflict, but it was owner to owner conflict. Um, these two owners, their neighbors, they were claiming, pointing fingers that each one of them was harassing the other one, being noisy. And it just got to the point where our law firm could no longer really mediate. We tried um, our ways. It wasn't successful. And then we brought in a third party mediator. Unfortunately, the mediation never went all the way through because one of the parties, um, one of the neighbors decided they didn't want to do it anymore. And so in order for mediation to work, both 
both sides really have to be willing to come to the table and come in good faith uh, to resolve the matter. But if one neighbor is just like, nope, I'm not doing this, then unfortunately it really doesn't work. So that's it. Again, um, I apologize for loss of power, but I hope we were able to get back up to speed and you know, we'll take more questions. Right, so um, anybody that has a question, if you wanna raise your hand, I can unmute you. I also, um, you know, we kind of lost a few minutes, so I know we're running late and I wanna respect everybody's time, but I also want people to be able to ask questions if they can. So um, Kyoko, please go ahead. Hi, um, I wanted to know, um, you know, about adopting the code of conduct for the whole community. Um, our board is pretty unanimous all the time. So, I mean, we're a, a very small, you know, building with 27 units, five board members. We've never had a disagreement within the board. Um, once in a while, we have one or two people. It's always the same people. This is probably true in every, you know, building who are like unhappy with things. and you know, that is when the language gets, um, you know, like compromised. I recently actually received an anonymous letter mailed to me by, I am sure one of the shareholders, I mean, from offsite, somebody actually went to New York and sent, you know, mailed me this letter. And all it said was, you're running this building like Trump. And no, like nobody said anything. Uh, I mean, like, no, you know, like, no, like, uh, you know, I, I have no idea who sent this. I mean, I have some idea, but it's not identified. I would love for something like that to stop. So, yeah. you know, I mean, the, the rest of the board sent um, email to everyone saying that they were really saddened by this and, you know, and that we would maybe informally talk about this at the annual shareholders meeting about having sort of better communication, you know, within the whole building. I mean, not just to point fingers at, you know, whoever wrote this, but at the same time, I don't really believe somebody could send something like that and be, you know, protected, you know, their privacy or whatever. Um, so I don't quite know what to do, except maybe to adopt this kind of code of civility or, you know, something like that for the whole building. So, so Kayoka, uh, yeah. a couple thoughts. First of all, First thing you need to do is understand what your documents allow for and to what extent do you, do you have authority to regulate that sort of interpersonal conduct by owners, okay? Right. Um, you may have provisions that sort of address behavior such as annoyance or nuisance or something of that mm -hmm. nature, which might provide some authority. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as Leslie said during her portion of the presentation, you know, we drafted anti-harassment policies for clients mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times they focused on behavior towards employed or contracted staff because that mm -hmm. also great liability issues with respect to hostile work environment or mm -hmm. uh, employment discrimination. So we wanted to focus upon that. Um, you may have ability to extend it to owners. I mean, your enforcement mechanisms are going to be rather limited. Right. Um, you know, you might have the ability to impose fines for sort of egregious behavior. Uh, but I think you need to tread carefully about mm -hmm. sort of extending a code of conduct to the membership um, because I think that there are risks um, of having it backfire and, and having mm -hmm. a reaction to the board um, about, you know, trying to sort of stay, you know, extend out of its lane and, and extend and regulate behavior that's really, you know, beyond the scope of what a association board typically would be engaged in. And I, I actually want to offer as a piece of advice, Kyoko, honestly, I, we're all neighbors here, right? And so I, I might bring it up in a board meeting, you know, in, a, in an open forum, say, you know, I received this letter and it's not cool, you know, and everybody should know about it. And, you know, this is, this shouldn't be how we treat each other as neighbors. I, I frequently find myself reminding in contentious board spaces, you know, everybody here is a volunteer and hopefully everybody here is, you know, rowing the boat in the same manner that we want the best for the association. Todd and Leslie went over the um, the fiduciary responsibility mm -hmm. that, you know, you need to, you need to consider the best for the association and, and attacking your neighbor is obviously not the best for the association. So maybe I, I, it sounds terrible, but public shaming. Um, so, is, <laughs> so do you think it would be okay to reveal what the letter said and that it was sent from New York? I mean, that might, I don't know about sending from New York, Kyoko. I know what association you're in, and I know the size of your association. Yeah, so I'm going to imagine we're in DC. 
Right, but I'm going to imagine that most people in your association know who the owner is in New York. Um, or gonna... somebody who went to New York. So, right. That's yeah. why I'm saying, I'm not sure I would say it came from New yeah. York, but I would, I think it's okay to say, yeah, I, as the board president received this letter that, you know, and, and this is the content of it. You could even share mm -hmm. the actual letter, but I, Leslie right. and Todd, do you see any problem with that? No, not if it's verbatim, not if it's verbatim. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I tend to recommend against sort of general descriptions of, of those mm -hmm. sort of statements in a way that might identify the person. Right, because I want to avoid defamation claims. But right. Yeah. Right. if yeah. it's you know, if say I received this letter from someone and this is what it says, I don't have a problem with it. And and yeah. that it was sent in the U.S. mail. I mean, so I mean, you know, what made it kind of scary to me was that somebody actually put it in the U.S. mail. I right. mean, they had it just like put it under there. my door. You know, right. at least they had to come to my door to do do that. Right. Yeah. When it's kind of like what Leslie said, it's easy to be a bully from behind a keyboard. This is just mm -hmm. an old-fashioned way of being a bully. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank um, you. No problem. We had a texted in question, uh, Leslie, and Todd about how, what if you suspect a breach of privilege? Is there a way to go about determining? So it, the question was if you, you know, somebody says something and you're like, eh, that's only the board should know that. How, how do you go about determining if there's been a breach? Can you ask to see emails? Do you bring it up in a meeting that, you know, mm -hmm. hey, Tommy down the hall mentioned this to me and somebody must have said something to him? Like, I think that's a conversation with the other board members. I think you yeah. hold it in private okay. and you ask those questions. Okay, cool. Um, all right, any other questions? Um, I'm not seeing any in the chat. So I guess um, I will say we are not going to have a board learning session in December because of all the holidays. Oh, we got a hand raised, hold on. Um, Loretta, go ahead, you gotta unmute. Being asked to unmute. Um, Loretta, did you have a question? You're still muted. All right, well, we'll see if Loretta does have a question. Um, we won't be having a session in December because of the holidays. Um, and so we'll be back online uh, the third week of January. I would. I did also have a question in the chat that I'll bring up. Um, this slide deck and this recording will be posted on the board learning session of our website as per usual. Um, and so Loretta, I'm going to give you another couple seconds. And if not, um, you can go ahead and email me or call me. Now, there you are. Hi. All I want to do is say I enjoyed the meeting and I thought this was such an excellent one. I wish we had more like this. Thank you, Loretta. And I want to be able to take it back to our board. Mm -hmm. I think it's just something that's needed. You know, we take for granted that we're doing the best, but our best could get us in trouble. So right. that's what I want to take from that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Loretta. And Thank you. just going into that comment, um, if you have ideas for future topics that you'd like for us to discuss, I know, um, I think we put that into our webinar um, registration email, uh, but also you can email me on mira.brown at ejfrealestate.com um, and let me know if you have thoughts on what you think we could address for you. Um, we'd appreciate that. So again, thank you all for coming. Todd and Leslie, thank you so much for your time on this. And thank you. Everybody pleasure. have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Thanks, Mira. Thanks, thank everybody. Appreciate it. Sorry thank you. for the technical glitch. <laughs>